you uh, highlight key tools and outcomes of MAR fund supported projects across the MAR. We hope that what we will share will have the potential for learning, exchange, scaling up, and replication across our four MAR fund countries. We note that the session is being recorded and we invite our participants to share their names, organizations, and the countries represented in the chat. We have just about 30 minutes for today's presentation. While the presenters are presenting, we would like to ask that any questions or comments are placed in the Q&R box or the Q&R session. We will have just about 20 minutes for the Q&R segment. At this time, I would like to hand over to our colleagues from Blue Ventures for our presentation today. However, before doing so, I would like to take a few minutes just to introduce our speakers. Fabian Kine. Fabian serves with Blue Ventures Global Science Program and worked in the development of the National Lionfish Management Strategy with partners across Belize. He has over 10 years experience working as both a scientist and a conservation planner across the Caribbean to support marine protected areas and small scale fisheries management. Fabian holds a master's degree in marine environment and resources from Southampton University and is currently working to finalize his PhD. His research interests include MPA design, connectivity, and governance, collecting data on invasive species and ecosystems health and functioning, work that will help to underpin good decision-making and deliver more effective conservation strategies. We also have with us today, Celso Shaw. Celso, who holds a degree in natural resources management, from the University of Belize, started his conservation work with the Belize Audubon Society as a park warden stationed at Half Moon Key, the whole national monument. Part of Belize's renowned World Heritage Site. During his time at Bass, Celso gained valuable knowledge in protected areas management, particularly in enforcement and in research and monitoring of commercially fished species. He joined Blue Ventures team in September 2008 and currently serves in the capacity of field work manager. Celso remains excited about the work that he does, about sharing and gaining valuable experiences with the Blue Ventures team and working closely with stakeholder communities. I take the opportunity once again to welcome our speakers. Celso and Fabian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angeline, for the great introduction. I'll I'll be um, conducting the first part of this presentation, and then we'll be followed by my colleague Fabian Kain. So today's webinar is going to be focused on lionfish control in Belize, the potential for regional replication within the region. So first of all, I would like to give you a brief background on, on the invasive lionfish. Um, as you have known, it's been in Belize. So it was first sighted in Belize since 2018 and officially recorded in 2009. Um, and it was first recorded, I would say, um, in 2008 at Turner Fatal, and then in 2009 it was recorded in the Southern Belize Barrier Reef Complex. So just to give you an overview of the, where they came from, or to give you an idea of the distribution, as you can see in this map, we have the um, the two species, which is the Poriterus volitans and the Poriterus miles. Um, in the Western Caribbean, um, you can see the progression in red, um, starting from the eastern part of the United States. Now they have um, reached the 
entire Gulf of Mexico, and it has reached the, um, the entire conquered entire region um, in the Caribbean. And now they are progressing towards the southern coast of South America. Um, not only that, though, there is another species that is invading the, um, the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there is a, a introduction of that species, which is um, believed to be coming from through the Suez Canal, which is called the Lepsian um, migration of this species. So as you can see, the, the, the blue and the green is where they are originally, where they're native, the Indo-Pacific region. Next slide. Okay, several studies has been conducted about this invasive species, one of the species that is being heavily um, researched on. And some of the characteristics of this um, of lion fisher, they are very successful invaders. So the first point here is um, they have no natural predators in our waters. So they are at top of the food chain, just like sharks and barracudas. So nothing eats them. And they can grow really fast. Um, they have a high um, consumption rate. They eat a lot of our native prey fish species. And additionally to that, they reproduce very fast once they reach to maturity. So in three to four days, they can um, span, um, they can, can span up to two million eggs per year. They are also an ecological generalist. So as you can see here, we have a wide variety of ecosystems from seagrass to mangroves to like the deeper shallow reef and back reef. So um, they reach at a range of 300 meters in depth. So they can really adapt to the environment that they live in. And additionally to that, they are skillful hunters. Um, lionfish has a large pectoral fin and they can also gulp their prey, which can jet stream their prey inside their mouth so that they can, um, they are very effective in partnering their prey. So they are very um, effective in consuming a lot of these native fish species. And they have a high food availability. So now they are in an ecosystem that has a wide variety of um, different species in our waters. Um, the reef is very rich and biodiverse. So um, they tend to establish themselves. They adapt really fast because food is available. And then um, additionally to that, it's unrecognized by native prey species. So a lot of our prey species don't really um, recognize lionfish as a predator because they're so small. And they're also, um, you know, they can reach really close and they can just um, go up their prey without the prey fish even noticing them. So, so just to give you an overview, in this diagram, we have here that um, lionfish grow and mature faster than most Western Atlantic mesopredators. And in our surveys, we have been um, have identified some of the competing predators, such as um, Mutton snapper, schoolmaster, gray snapper, dog snapper, and if you can see in the diagram, which is highlighted here, um, the the minimum age of maturity for a lionfish is one year, and if you can see, if it compares to other um, competitor species, they are a little bit more. So this gives an advantage to lionfish to um to to mature at that stage very fast, and it also has a higher growth rate than most of our, of our native fish species. So complete eradication is unlikely. Um, I think they have conquered this entire region. So we have um, recognized now that um, complete eradication of lionfish is really impossible. Um, but there is something that we can do which comes to, to the control. And that's what part of our project is about, is to implement effective control across marine protected areas. So in this infograph, you can see the significant ecological impacts of lionfish. Um, it's an invasive species which threatens our coral reef. Belize has the second largest barrier reef, so it's very biodiverse. And if you can see the first diagram, we can see that um, a beautiful reef. We have uh, several species, nice ecosystem. And as soon as an uh, invasive species is introduced, um, the ecosystem degrades, you know, the, um, the native species are being um, degraded as well, and the, the invasive species overpopulates. And here in Belize, we have over 100 pre species, and 
in this infographic it also details that a thousand lionfish can, can, can consume five million prey fish in one year. So that's a lot of fish. The most significant change to coral reef since industrial fishing. Some fish are impacted more than others. Um, in our detailed survey of prey species, uh, we have identified um, we have fishes that are most vulnerable and, and, and there are species that are low risk. All of these species that we have are, are native species. They're small, small shallow bodied and solitary fish were identified as very, very um, vulnerable. And if you can see in terms of size, shape, their aggregation size, their water column position, and how active they are at night or during the day, and their behavior as well. As are very um, important um, characteristics to identify prey species that are very, very vulnerable to lionfish. So we can highlight some of the few here. Um, go back, Fabian. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that um, we know we, in our coral reefs, uh, um, part fish are protected, and there are some smaller part fish, especially the green blotch part fish, which are really small fish. Um, they are very mature at that stage when their their body size is small, so they are really vulnerable to to um, lionfish in terms of prey. And then we have the shallow bodied um, shallow bodied lion um, fishes, which is more like the ras um, um, species. And there are ones that are solitary, and then there are the blennies and the goby that are um, like a just sedentary species. So all of these species are very highly vulnerable. To um, prey. If you look at the other species like um, butterfly fish, you know, there, there are French grunts that are in schools, they are less vulnerable, which we call low risk um, species. But they are still targeted. I'm not saying that they're not being targeted by lionfish, they're still being targeted. Um, one of the great cons concerns is of important of consequence for endemic species. And, in Saltwater Key, there is this endemic species, the social ras, which a single lionfish can consume a dozen of juvenile social ras every day. Lionfish are pushing this critical endangered species closer to extinction. So these are endemic species. So when lionfish consume them, they just degrade these species at a higher rate because they're endemic and they, this can lead to extinction. Why are they important though? They feed on plankton, but um, they feed on plankton that comes from open ocean, which serves as a nutrient source for reef itself, transferring resources from the open ocean to the reef. Removing them can have a severe impact on the local ecosystem's health. Um, based on research um, that has been conducted across this region, um, especially in Belize and, and Belize, Bahamas, and Curacao, Belize is a hot spot of potential impact for lionfish. Um, it is being identified that um, 77 fish species with small ranges identified as most risk. Um, so in 2009 and um, 19, there was a, a document formulated by um, Blue Ventures uh, in line with our partners to establish a national lionfish management strategy and a working group to manage um, lionfish. So this um, document was um, has a vision to adopt managing lionfish in a participatory manner to protect and improve livelihoods of all Belizeans and the health of Belize marine environment. A key objective of this strategy is to develop, develop a long-term community-led monitoring program responsible for guiding effective lionfish management, monitoring, and evaluation effort across release. Um, it is identified that um, interconnectedness of the system is, is, is very key. So, you know, you have coral reefs and its associated species. Um, there's a lot of components that is um, um, connected to this. We have species that are targeted by traditional fisheries, which are the commercial fish species, especially the fin fish species. And then it also has a connection with um, ecotourism, 
and also management of rural marine protected areas. So what is um, here, you know, lionfish population increases. Um, there's a possibility for like a, a for lionfish um, catch, which will contribute to a lionfish market, which we ideally want to um, to um, encourage, you know, to, to, to have people um, call lionfish and it, it eventually leads to um, the restaurants and uh, so that it has, has a value to it. And in that term, management is um, being implemented, which is also contribute to the economic development and tourism of our coral reef ecosystem. And in that return, the fishing community benefits from it because there will be more fish because there's less um, um, lion fish within this ecosystem. So there's that interconnectedness that we have to establish for it to properly um, work. So I want to reflect back on, 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 a, on a data that was um, on an assessment that was done nationally in 2015 when we um, implemented this um, um, program. Um, this research was conducted nationally to, to get a baseline data on an assessment of the live fish density within these protected areas. So we have um, all of these are priority areas as um, identified areas with high density of lionfish. So I can just mention them here. We have Saltwater Key Marine Reserve. We have Sapaduli Key Marine Reserve, Key Carker, Bacalar Chico, and Turdef Marina. Turdef Ato Marine Reserve and Gladden Spit and Silk Keys Marine Reserve. So part of our program um, now is to um, pilot the project that we are undergoing. We have started work with Turnoff Atoll Marine Reserve and along with um, the Northern Belize Coastal Complex, which encompasses um, three marine protected areas. We have Kikaka Marine Reserve, Holchan Marine Reserve, and Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. Um, hopefully this year, um, we are planning to move into Southwater Key Marine Reserve. So now let me um, go in detail of the project that we are working on. Um, which has started in 2020 with the support of um, our donors, uh, which are listed um, below. So the name of our project is Establishing Effective Lion Fish Management in Belize's Repl Fish Replenishment Zones. So this will support Belize marine protected areas managers to establish a scalable model for effective and participatory lionfish adaptive management. So here are our key focus in terms of delivering this project is to have um, develop a um, capacity building involving key stakeholders that are part of this um, protected areas and marine reserve and piloting an approach that can be replicated throughout the Latin American and Caribbean region. So our project components and activities. So there's three components to it. We have um, First, we go there and train and, and do an assessment of, of the area. We train the um, whosoever is involved, we train them to a capacity in, 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 in diving and, you know, the full um, LFS method to, to conduct assessment on lionfish and the reef. And then after that, we go out and, and develop a control plan based on the baseline data that we collect. And then the third part of this is to implement control, which is um, fully going to be taken on by the people that we train to start implementing control within this area. So if you look at um, of like one example that we have conducted work with, which is Turnoff Atoll Marine Reserve, um, first we establish a, a six person control team, and then we train them to do it in, in we put it open water to advance open water certification level. And then we also um, train them in the lionfish focus search methodology. So, and then we go out there. Once we train them, we take them out to do assist us in collecting the baseline data for lionfish prey and fish density, lionfish density. And then from that data, we develop the control plan. And after developing that control plan, we have um, we go out and, and do a consultation like with our partners to develop this control plan, what can be the ideal, um, what needs, what the focus has to be then on, 
on why um, these areas, separated areas, what are the indicators that we can develop to, to measure um, why these um, areas is prioritized for um, lionfish culling. And then um, go back to you then, please. Then we go on back and, and, and do um, like a share results of what we um, identified um, in our research, like the results, and we go back to the community and, and synthesize these community about our, our, our research. Okay, um, training and capacity building. So. Um, since 2020, BV has trained 18 marine protected area staff and partners in the following area. We have the lionfish focus search methodology. We have the principle of lionfish monitoring and adaptive management, fish ID training, paddy scuba certification. And lastly, we have the emergency first response and first aid. Then we do an assessment. So update population status surveys of LFS method in four marine protected areas. So this just shows um, the marine, marine protected areas that we have been um, implementing this project. We have Bacala Chico Marine Reserve. Um, we have Kikaka Marine Reserve, Holchan Marine Reserve, and Turnif Atal Marine Reserve. So this area we are planning to move to Saltwater Key Marine Reserve. And how do we do this um, methodology? Um, I just wanted to um, to share um, how the data is being collected. Um, the survey methodology is the lionfish focus search methodology. Um, we it's a regional protocol which was developed by um, Stephanie Green, and it measures lionfish and impacts for complex reef system. So all surveyors trained and certified in LFS and Fish ID, which is a rigorous training that we um, undertake to, to have everyone ID the fish to um, family name, common names, and then also um, um, sizing so that you can measure the fish underwater. So the three components of this is, um, you know, all of this has been um, in correlation with, um, you know, the old MBRS methodology which is um, we have a 50 meter by one meter transects for larger bodied fish, you know? So when you make the first pass, you're recording fishes that are, are, are larger than 15 centimeter. Um, that's just to give you an overview of like the, the, the fish status that are larger. And then you do a rover diving survey for lionfish, which is gonna be a 50 meter transect by 10 meter. So here you're recording lionfish and also you're recording um, competitor species that are um, that are like in the grouper family. We have barracudas. Um, specifically, these are like predators. And then we have the prey species, which are, um, we call it the prey survey, which is a two meter by 20 um, transect. On that same 50 meter, we record all the smaller fish species that are, that are there. So this is diagram is just to give you uh, a synopsis of how the survey is being conducted. So you have your first run, which is the dotted red line in yellow. You have your first run to take um, the larger fish, and then you wait two minutes for the fish to aggregate back because fish, they tend to swim when they see you. So you allow two minutes for you to aggregate, um, let the fish, smaller fish aggregate back, and then you pass again to survey the prey species. And then this is where like the whole, um, um, you know, like the amount of team that you have, usually it's six. So you have people that are doing prey survey, you have people doing, um, doing the rover diving for lionfish and competitor species, which is um, in five meter on one side and five meter on the other side. And this usually takes like at least 30 minutes to 35 minutes to complete the entire survey. So here's an example of our data sheet. Um, 
we have um, what we collect for lionfish for competitor species as well um, you know like the, it's a detailed data sheet that all the um, components that we need to collect on and there are a few species that are considered as commercially valuable species and also predators as you can see in this photograph then we have a specific data sheet for um, prey fish species um, these are smaller fishes and it's it's very detailed um, um, you look at um, smaller body fish like the blennies and goobies, the smaller ras and part fish and damsel fish. You see a lot on these um, surveys. So now um, I'll hand it over to my partner, Fabian Kain. Thanks very much, Salsa, for, for giving, you know, sort of a background and sort of how the program has evolved over the last few years. Um, what it, thanks, first of all, to Mark and for, for inviting me to, to share with you. But what I want to spend a bit of time doing now is talking you through some of the science and um, the results that we found from, from the program. So in any sort of, um, in any monitoring program, there's there's key questions that come that come out of it. And for the lionfish program specifically, we were looking at questions, thing, things like how many lionfish should be removed, how much effort is required, and which areas should be prioritized. So these were the sort of themes that were coming out of some of the dialogue as we started interventions with different protected areas. So we understand that with this program we're trying to we're trying to focus on suppression in high priority conservation areas so this includes things like juvenile fish habitats and marine protected areas so you know take conservation zones um, and the objective of this is to make the most effective use of limited resources so we know in this sector you know you're, you're working with resource scarcity um, for personnel, for funding, for operational support. So the aim and the objective of our of the work is to make the most effective use of resources. So you have effect, you can identify and prioritize control efforts. So when answering the question of how many lionfish can kind of we tolerate, um, this was first approached by one of our research partners, Dr. Stephanie Green and her collaborators in 2014. And she proposed this idea of an ecological threshold model. And don't worry about the scary, the scary sort of equation at the top, but what this, this, this model effectively does is it combines the surveys that are collected by Celso and his team on fish biomass and other native um, associated competitors and prey species, the lionfish predation rates that are found on the surveys, and also lionfish density and body sizes. Um, and what the model does is it establishes a tipping point between the rate at which lionfish consume prey and the rate at which new prey biomass is created. So this is known as the ecological threshold. And it's the approach focuses very much or very similarly to this idea of limits of acceptable change. And by linking removal targets to the ecological effects of the invader, what we're able to do is develop conservation targets, quantitative targets that maintain lionfish populations below levels that cause ecological damage, which has many advantages, especially when you're trying to apply this to um, multiple marine protected areas and certainly at seascape level and it allows you to make the most effective use of resources for control so once the surveys have been completed what we do is we work with local partners to establish a control plan that includes quantitative targets so this one is one that was developed um, back in 2021 for turnif atoll marine reserve which 
as many of you know, is, is Belize's most developed and diverse marine reserve in, in or marine atoll in Belize. And what those targets allow is that once that those density and thresholds have been established, you're able to look at that data and identify the key priority areas using those thresholds so that you can develop a, a control plan. And then that control plan is reviewed and written up and, and agreed and then implemented by the Marine Protected Area Manager with the intention that by focusing control on these protect on these prioritized sites, we are able to effectively reduce lionfish populations and start to see improvements in the prey fish species and associated um, native, native species, which should then lead over time to an increase in commercial fish and improvements um, in traditional fish catches in the long term. So one of our case studies, so the Ternafato Marine Reserve is the first um, partner that we, we implemented this program with back in 2020. And um, the study, the initial survey showed that there was a 60% presence detected of, of lionfish, uh, with 75% of lionfish surveyed already sexually mature, and it suggested a resident breeding population in the reserve like many protected areas that we see within the Caribbean region. And over time, by implementing con a control plan, TASA has been able to reduce key indicators that would, were identified, such as lionfish total length, lionfish density, um, the ecological threshold density and percentage of sites exceeding threshold. And what this is, the data shows is that an end of year evaluation back in 2021 shows that all key indicators are decreasing and we're seeing fewer lionfish observed on surveys and a 50% reduction in lionfish density across those prioritized sites. Um, so the data is showing that by, by work, working with this ecological threshold model, and focusing your control efforts on these priority zones, you're able to reduce the lionfish that are impacting the most important areas within the reserve that have been identified from the data. Um, I'll just quickly show you, and we, we might not have time to go through this in much detail, but um, part of our data sharing and feedback efforts are to are to develop dashboards that help to showcase this data effectively. So we use a traffic light system to look at lionfish threshold status, red for over, orange for near, and green for under threshold. And you can click on each of these sites that were surveyed, and it gives more information about the status and the, the different indicators that are important for an MPA manager to monitor. Another thing that we've incorporated in this program is regular um, adaptive management reviews. So looking at the success and evaluating how the project is going over time. By sh showing the data, you're able to see sort of how this is changing in the different management zones of the reserve, as well as looking at different habitat types as well. So, yeah. So the, this is showing lionfish density across the different management zones in the general use zone, military zone, and you've got 2021, mm -hmm. uh, 2020, 2021, and then the threshold, the average threshold. And this is just a snapshot of, of sort of how the data can be can be visualized and reviewed for to support management. So we've been doing this over a number of, of years, and what we're realizing is that there's a there's a number of lessons learned. 
um, as we go through each iteration of the program. So one of the key messages we understand is it's important to adapt, to adapt the program to suit the local context of each MPA. So every, every protected area, every management unit is, is different and has different needs and priorities and challenges. So it's important to be aware of that when you're designing programs. Another key component is the fact that they should be participatory and community-led with key, a lot of emphasis on data sharing and feedback with local communities so that you can encourage buy-in from, from the start of the project. Um, we also recognize that the LFS method, it's a regional protocol, but it's very resource intensive and expensive. So a lot of our focus has been around building capacity nationally so that we have a, a pool of experts that we can draw from or, or capacity that we can draw from to be able to implement this in the different protected areas we work. Uh, we're also conducting some research in how we can simplify this method and still ensure its robustness so that there is more opportunity to scale it um, out to other invaded regions. One of the things I wanted to highlight as we close is that through dialogue with the fisheries department and the lionfish working group, which is a diverse um, resource user group established to look at the invasion here in Belize, we, we've just had a lionfish removal policy um, endorsed and adopted by the Belize fisheries department this August. And what that policy seeks to do is um, establish a more inclusive and participatory approach to effective management. So we're very excited that we have the underpinnings to, to sort of move this work, to grow various model, and, um, and develop it in, in, in other, other, other areas. So in closing, lionfish are here to stay. And um, a recent study was conducted focusing on two decades of work from the Western Atlantic lionfish invasion and providing those or sharing those lessons learned uh, with policymakers and researchers in the Mediterranean who are tackling um, the most recent invasion in the Mediterranean. And what we're seeing is that our approach is, has focused on a much more holistic strategy, which includes participatory management and promoting lionfish hunting and encouraging new markets. And all of these themes are coming out from the research that are important to incorporate into any lionfish management strategy. So by reinforcing effective management of marine resources through community-led interventions, our program protects critical ecosystems from the damaging impacts of lionfish in these, particularly in these special, uh, highly protected conservation areas. And it helps to mitigate a threat to traditional commercial fisheries and, and ensure local and coastal communities benefit from the sustainability or benefit sustainably from the biodiversity that's preserved. And this really supports Belize's comm commitment to national and international targets. Um, we have a long way to go, but through continued collaboration, we're working to reach 25% of lionfish control, effective control in Belize's near shore by 2024. So I just want to close there and say thank you very much um, for the opportunity from Mark and to, to present today. And thank you to all our partners and collaborators that have supported our journey to the Rolanda Way. So, so thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. So, so Apologies for the rain. It looks like <laughs> it rain rained out towards the end there. Yes, yeah. It's happening nationally at the moment. A lot of rains and floods. Um, thank you both, Soso -so and Fabian, for that great and um, at this time, we want to open our question and answer segment. Um, I'll have a look in the question and answer box. 
Uh, currently, we have one question. I will read that question. It states, based on your experience, how do you envision effective regional collaboration for control of lionfish? Did you guys get that? Did I, do I need to repeat? Hello, guys, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Did you guys get the question? I'll, I'll repeat it again. Based on your experience, how do you envision effective regional collaboration for control of lionfish? Do you want to take that, Fabian? You want to take that one, Samson? Sure. I think based on my experience, um, I think um, we have come a long way um, trying to conduct a lot of a survey. Um, you know, not only in the Caribbean, but we are adapting here in Belize. I think we have um, a very good baseline data from the 2015 um, baseline data that we collected. And now we are specifically going into the MPAs and and replicating those same baseline data now. So I think um, as soon as we get a percentage of of at least the entire barrier reef, I would believe that um, we have this data that will guide specific management targets that we want to implement for control. And I think passing the, the policy as well is will go hand in hand in terms of guiding what is the next steps in terms of involving all the stakeholders that are involved in, in within this NPA, especially it is really something that we have to bring together, you know, like the all, all the stakeholder, I think that policy is going to guide it now. So the next step is to kind of adopt that policy so that everybody is in, in line with it. So I think for for that, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to fully accomplish it. And then as soon as we have targeted that within the national context, then I feel like um, that context can be adapted regionally, regionally to, to other parts of the Caribbean or within this small region. Is there anything you would like to add, Fabian? Sorry, I just wanted to add that to Salsa's point that um, when you're trying to foster re regional collaboration, I think what our project or BV's program focuses on is marine protected areas and, and is, is looking at the management units and sort of really focusing on how to, to prevent any additional impacts that are happening from the lionfish invasion on the conservation of those areas. But there's many different management strategies that have been proven to be effective, including, you know, encouraging new markets for, for lionfish fishing outside of those zones, um, education and awareness strategies, sort of promoting ecotourism, as Celso mentioned earlier. So, so all of these are key strategies that do work. And um, I think what, what's really important is to make sure we continue, you know, lionfish have been, we've been fighting this for, for two decades. And there's a number of people in this room that, that have, have been working on this problem since, since the start of the invasion. So it's all about ensuring there are forums and opportunities to collaborate and share best practice. And such as this one, and, and then share that in the new invasion, invasion funds that, that are occurring in the Mediterranean, in Brazil, so that we can, we can all learn and, and, and build on what we know and, and sort of how, you know, improve on that as, as we go. Thank you both for your responses to that question. Are there any other questions for our colleagues from New Ventures? I am having a look at 
question and answer box. I'm not seeing it. And yet this time, um, either can be a raise of hand or something if there are other questions from other participants connected. One raise of hand. One moment. I'm trying to see who it is. Maria Jose Gonzalez has her hands raised. Can we enable Maria Jose to speak? Just one woman and here, Maria Jose Gonzalez. In the meantime, um, while we're getting that sorted, I have another question that has been written into the box. Has the use of non-bycatch traps been implemented anywhere in your area? This is a question from Nicholas. Has the use of non-bycatch traps been implemented anywhere in your area? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, in the presentation, Celso mentioned uh, lionfish are ecological generalists. So they, they exist from shallow water up to a thousand feet deep. So deep water trapping is, is a very important um, tool that can be used when it's implemented effectively. I know Belize has been looking at exploring that and it's um, a strategy that was also included in the National Lion Fish Management Strategy. So, so the use of deep water trapping. I know there's a couple of partners that have been working with the fisheries department um, to start to test that and, and, and develop it um, here in this in the southern Belize, and I know there's also some partners in Honduras that have been doing it. So, um, but the, re the reality is trap, the use of traps is very expensive. Um, it's resource intensive, you know, you're looking at these deep water traps, but they do, they do offer an opportunity to, to cull the invasion if, if they can be locally sourced, locally produced, and also effectively implemented within the guidelines that we've developed uh, within okay, thank the you. guidelines developed sort of through the line fish management strategy and Belize's uh, sort of own regulation. Thank you, Fabian. I think we have now the capability for Maria Jose to speak. Thank you, Angie, and um, thank you, Fabian and Silso. That, that was a very, very interesting presentation. And, and I think it's a great reminder of how, um, how serious this problem is, right? Uh, it, it may seem on occasion that people think it's past, right? But it, it's still very much, very much with us, very much in the region. Um, have, what you have done, uh, in, in Belize, in terms of, of applying this methodology, has it been done in other parts where there is uh, um, invasion of lionfish? Or is Belize, let's say, the first, the first example of applying that methodology? Sorry, Maria, can you just repeat that question again? Yes, of course. Um, and let me know if, if you don't hear me. I, I, was, I was just asking if the methodology we have applied now in Belize um, you know, to determine that threshold, et cetera, that is this something that has been applied elsewhere? And what, in how many other areas has this been methodology applied? Sure, thanks, thanks for repeating that. I just got drowned out by the, by the rain again. <laughs> yes. Um, so the lionfish focus search was, was first developed, I think, in 2014. 
by, by one of our research partners at the University of Alberta, Dr. Stephanie Green. And it was first implemented in the Bahamas with um, sort of as a pilot site. So they, they only focused on um, Bahamian patch reef ecosystems. And um, it, so she's, she's um, some, she produced results related to these ecosystems um, as a sort of pilot study. And then what I understand is it was then implemented in Bacala Chico over a number of years um, through the expedition program Blue Ventures used, was running there for, for a number of years. And um, we've now sort of rolled that out to other areas in, in Belize. So as far as I'm aware, and I see Jen, Jen Chapman on the line, who was sort of critical to some of the earlier work um, before my time on this. But as far as I'm, I'm aware, Belize is the first one to pilot it sort of nationally as an approach and a methodology, um, working specifically with marine protected areas. But we are very keen on working and collaborating with other countries that that um, where there is there is appetite and, and interest to sort of um, yeah to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Fabian. Moving um, along, I know that Matteo Sabido also had his hand up. The floor is yours. Are you hearing us, Matteo? Do you still have that question for us? Okay, um, while we try to reconnect with Matteo, I have a question here from D. Um, would it help if the population of harnet fish or eels are increased in the invaded areas. And then there is also a follow-up question from D, which reads, are sharks immune to the venom? Did you guys get those two questions? So, so I'll, let you, I'll let you take those ones. Yeah, I, I can answer the first one um, about eels. I think um, since when lionfish was um, first sighted in Belize in 2008, I think um, a lot of program from the fisheries department was to to, to have these, um, um, you know, like price for you to kill lionfish. And, and it has shown like over time, you know, like people are starting to feed these to like other predators that exist, especially barracuda sharks, eels. Um, I think um, after that, a few years after that, it was completely banned to um, change this behavior for, for, for um, other predators. So for Belize specifically, I think it's, it's a no-go now to um, have other um, predators consume lionfish. And then the other part of the question, which is, um, do sharks um, are immune to to the venom? I believe it does because I there is a number of times when um when you spear um lionfish uh, um they come and, and consume they consume lionfish and it doesn't affect affect the um but um to specifically say that um what is the effects on them I I cannot say that. Thank you very much for the response so, so. Um, If there are no other questions and seeing that we are basically rolling out, I think I see a hand. Let me see one, one second. Yes, I have a question from Theo and I will ask um, if our colleagues <clears throat> at Central Oxford can help us with interpretation of the question, please.
Yes, uh, sure, go ahead. It, the question is in the question and answer box. It's written in the box. Hold on. I consider that um, uh, diffusion should be strengthened of all actions that have to do with control and management of lionfish and all the mar area. This could help to continue to create awareness in the communities and not to um, to lose interest in the in the topic. So to sensitize to talk more about it. This is not a question, it's a comment. comment. Thank you. Yes. I just realized that. <laughs> Thank you so much for that comment, Mateo. Um, if there are no other questions or comments from <clears throat> our colleagues and partners present here today, um, I'll just give a two second pause to see if there's anything else anyone would like to add. If there is not, um, noting that we are rounding out the hour um, for this webinar, see, give me one minute, I think I see something else. Colleagues at um, Central Oxford, um, Gloria, can you, can you assist us again? There is another, I believe there's another comment from Mateo in the box. Okay, uh, regarding the methodology here in Mexico, we have adapted the MAR traditional monitoring and the AGRA monitoring to evaluate the densities of the lionfish because the methodology, the LFS methodology that has been used implies many economic uh, expenses, financial expenses and human resources. Okay, and I also see that Mateo's hand has gone up. So before I ask um, our colleagues at Blue Venture if there is any thoughts or anything that they would like to share, given Mateo's comments, um, I will open for him to speak. See his hand up. I think he can go ahead and ask a question if it's in English. I don't think we're hearing. Mateo, would you like to speak? Okay, I don't know if there's any follow up to his comments, um, Celso and Fabian, if there's anything you want to add. At this time yeah i'm not sure if it's a com it's a question or a comment i think what i can capture from the i can try to translate it and say how do you diffuse um, information to control lionfish in the region which is the sam region this can help sensitize the communities hola um, buenos dias disculpen <laughs> <laughs> Bueno, yo les voy a hablar en español. Okay, so two important comments that I, I consider important. The first is to be able to achieve, to, to strengthen diffusion of all actions that are taking place in the MAR, both for control, for management, because as Maria Jose says, the lionfish has been around for a long time. It, some people think it's over, but there are still many people that are working to uh, on this topic. And I think it's very important to, to diffuse this and because uh, we need people to continue encouraged and also for more people to raise up, to rise up to, to help out with it. And so it can be seen as a, whole at the mar, not just in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Honduras, but as um, some, uh, that so that we can, other people can see that not just in Escalao and Chichorro activities are being uh, done, but in many parts of the mar, that there are people that are very interested in controlling this situation. The other is referring to the mythology here in 
the south of Quintana Roo, what we did was adapt the protocols that were already being put in place in the, for a long time, the, the MAR and AGRA protocols. We know that the funds for monitoring of lionfish is expensive and also the methodology that was proposed in 2012 is expensive, implies more uh, scuba divers, more materials. If just to evaluate the condition of the reef is expensive. Imagine monitoring lionfish. So what we did was to adjust the methodology that we already have to be able to include the lionfish. And it has given us good results in Chinchorro. And I understand that other protected areas of the Mexican area, they are implementing um, some of these. And, and congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much, um, Mateo. Um, uh, is there anything you guys would like to add, Celso and Fabian? Not. Um, then I would like to thank you all for being us with being here with us today on behalf of Marfon and Blue Ventures. We give you a big thank you for joining us um, today for this presentation. And we ask that you look out for the next session that is being organized in our Marfon webinar series. It was great having you with us today and we wish you a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone and thanks, thanks Angie and, and Marfan for the opportunity to, to join you today and, and share, share some of our story. So, so maybe just put a contact, or I think Angie can follow up with a contact if, if anybody has yes. any questions or would like any resources or materials um, related to this program, we'll be happy to follow up with you. Sure, we can follow up with the recording of the session, the PDF of the presentation and contact information for our colleagues at Blue Ventures. Thank you, um, Fabian, for reminding us of that. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, for you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.